Ernest Gordon spent three years at a Japanese prisoner of war camp during World War II. The camp was known by many as the death house. The sights, the sounds, the smell of suffering were unmistakable. After months of back-breaking labor, daily beatings, and slow starvation, Gordon's health declined to a point where he was no longer able to get out and about. He was confined to his bed. His health had declined to such a degree, to such a point that you could, could take your hands and, and wrap them around his legs. The groans of the dying and the smell of death fill the air at Chiang Kai. Hope was all but lost. Even the allied soldiers that were there as prisoners of war, they began to turn on each other. Uh, they began to fight for food uh, scraps. They, they were stealing from one another. They even robbed from the dying. It was a barbaric scene as they were turning on each other. Uh, Gordon no longer had the energy nor the desire to get up and get about. Uh, conditions were so bad that death by disease seemed better and more pleasant than living at the death house. I said hope was all but lost. There was a, a glimmer of hope that remained in the camp, but it was rekindled as two new prisoners of war came in. And even though they were hurting, they had wounds, uh, they weren't being fed very much either, but they began to, to share. They began to share some of the few things that they had as far as their, their food provisions. They began to serve one another. Uh, these new prisoners of war came in, and, and they were doctoring, they were caring for Gordon's wounds. They gave Gordon his first bath in six weeks. And his health began to, uh, to improve. And his dignity was restored. It was amazing to watch how contagious this was as these soldiers now cared for each other's needs and they shared their belongings. These were multiple soldiers that had bought into this new way of life, of care and compassion and service. It was a great moment in that camp. I, I love this line. Service and sacrifice. Service and sacrifice replaced selfishness and solitude. Service and sacrifice replaced selfishness and solitude. Two decades later, Ernest Gordon served as chaplain at Princeton University. And he said, Death was still with us, no doubt about that. But we were slowly being freed from its destructive grip. Selfishness, hatred, and pride were all anti-life. Love, self-sacrifice, and faith, on the other hand, they were the essence of life. Gifts of God to men. Death no longer had the last word at Chiang Kai. Death no longer had the last word at Chun Kai. We live in a day and age that right now I refer to it really kind of as the sludge of society. Uh, there's nothing about that word that sounds good and it's not intended to. When I'm talking about sludge of society, what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about that selfishness, that hatred, that pride. And it permeates so much of all of our society. We don't have to go to a prisoner of war camp to see people turning on each other and to see people robbing each other and to see selfishness about. All we have to do is look around us. For many of us, our students and teachers that are returning to school, some this past week, some this coming week, will return to the classroom. Just look around you and you'll see that. You'll see this selfishness, this hatred, and this pride and of how it is so destructive to relationships, and to the health of society as a whole. We'll see it at school. We'll see it at industry. 
those of us that go to work, whether it's in a boardroom, whether it's out in a plant, but we see these same uh, attributes, these attitudes that demonstrate themselves. Man, it is about selfishness. People are hating on each other. Pride fills the air. And if you're not seeing it in school or in industry, it may be possible that you're experiencing it at home. Because when selfishness, hatred, and pride, and, and other attributes like that, when they begin to permeate our home, it is destructive to marriages and to family. All right, so how can we tell? What is a, what is a sign of some early problems that, to be able to diagnose that? Well, I think one of the things that we can do is look at the use of personal possessive pronouns. Just simply look at how they're dominating conversations in our society today. It's the specific terms uh, like this. My life, my career, my stuff. It's words like me, myself, and I that just continues to speak of our selfishness. And we listen to how people are talking to one another. And we listen to how people like to talk about themselves. Selfishness, hatred, and pride. They aren't the only ingredients of sludge, but they are three of the primary ingredients for sludge. Our hope today is that we will be encouraged and we will be challenged by our Bible study in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And as we make our way there, I think about how we need people like those new prisoners of war that came in and they just change the whole culture and the whole atmosphere of that camp. It was life-saving change that came into that camp because of a couple of men that just dared to be different. How we need that same thing. How we need to be different. How we need to dare to be different for the cause of Christ. We see that today with a, a wonderful story of a lady that steps in and encourage and just in her, her intelligence, her quick thinking, and her care of how she steps in the gap and of how she saves the day. All right, we're making our way to 1 Samuel chapter 25. As we do, I need to give us just a little bit of background to get us ready for our lesson. Here's where we are in Scripture. Saul remains king, although Saul has been rejected as king. David, uh, this young shepherd boy that took out this giant Goliath, he was rising in popularity, but boy, he was a wanted man. Saul was hunting him down. Saul wanted him dead. Saul was so filled with rage and jealousy that he wanted to see harm come to David. But David was the Lord's anointed. He was the one that had been chosen to be Israel's next king. So, meanwhile, while David is running from Saul, he has about 400 men with him or more, and so he's got hundreds of men with him, and they go about and from village to village, and they're protecting people. It's almost like a neighborhood watch. <laughs> There's a great story in chapter 23 of where David and his men go in and they save the day for this community that was being uh, invaded by the Philistines. And at the Lord's direction, David and his men fought them and defeated the Philistines. And they were heroes in that community. All right, so we need to know that because David is going to be a vital part of the story today. We meet another family in chapter 25, verses 2 and 3. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. I need us to go ahead and start to see the contrast in these two. When we start using words for Nabal, he is mean, he is, has a bad temper, he thinks of himself, he's selfish. Abigail, on the other hand, she is intelligent, and we are going to see her put that intelligence in quick action later in our story. 
So, David hears about the fact that Nabal is shearing his sheep. It's that time of the year. And David and his men have been serving as his neighborhood watch. He thought that it might be a good time to go to visit Nabal. And perhaps Nabal would show some kindness for the things that David and his men had done. So here's the message that was sent. David sent a group of men in chapter 25, verse 7. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. As your own servants, ask them. They'll tell you. Therefore be favorable toward my men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name, and they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and my water and the meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men who are coming from who knows where? David's men turned around and they went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. What happened? The ball literally snubbed David and his men. Who's David? Who is this son of Jesse? And David was upset. David was upset. In fact, David and, and his group of men were, were strapping swords around their waist, and they were going to visit Nabal, a follow-up visit, if you will, and it wasn't going to end well, because David had on his heart to kill Nabal and all of the men with him. Meanwhile, in chapter 25, verse 14, one of the servants went to Abigail, Nabal's wife, and said, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time they were out in the fields near them. There was nothing that was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now, think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. All right, so we're finding out more about Nabal and the more we find out about him, it's just not good. It, it's like everything we find out just helps us to realize a little bit more of how bad he is. Nabal was rich. He was a very rich man. But he was bad-tempered. He was unfriendly. He was mean. He was unapproachable. I love this line from the servant who said, He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Oh, this is a bad environment. Can, can you see the sludge all in that community? And it really starts with Nabal. So here we are. Meanwhile, though, uh, Abigail, who has already been described in Scripture as intelligent and beautiful, she's also quick thinking. And if you follow the story, I think in verse 18, if you start following the story, you'll find out that she quickly prepared Bread, wine, sheep, grain, and so much more. She prepared it, got it ready, and she made her way out to meet David as David and his men were on the way to visit the ball. Chapter 25, verse 21. David's frustration continues to rise as he's making his way there. It's like the more he thinks about it, the more, the, the more that that uh, desire to, to take Nabal out just continues to grow. He says, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing, and he paid me back evil for good. He paid me back evil for good. Now, he's on his way. Abigail has been quick thinking. She's put these 
these gifts together, if you will, and she's on her way out to meet David. In verse 23, Scripture tells us, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please, pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool. And folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all those intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. She's intelligent. (laughs) Abigail is quick thinking. And she has a very impressive way with words in communicating the thoughts of her heart. So much so that impressed David. Verse 35 says, Then David accepted from her hand what she brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your word and have granted your success. So Abigail can wipe the sweat from her brow. Disaster averted. She makes her way back home, and as she makes her way back home, she's going to tell Nabal what has happened. But he has been holding a banquet, and Scripture says he is in high spirits. Actually, he was very drunk. And so Abigail decided to wait till the next morning to say anything about it. Verse 37 tells us, Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed, and he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord had struck Nabal, and he died. David didn't have to kill Nabal, did he? Nabal was really his own Uh, self-destructive behavior. He had lived in such a way that it was seen by the Lord. And Nabal was now dead. David heard that and, and David thought of Abigail because he had been quite impressed with her. So much so that David asked Abigail to be his wife and she agreed. All right. Let's get to some lessons learned because we've still got a pretty good practical point to make for us. All right. First of all, Nabal means fool. Scripture tells us that. And Nabal acted out his name. Uh, His foolishness angered David. The way that he snubbed his bad temper, his selfishness, his pride, it angered David. Now, Abigail, though, you've got two men that are are in conflict with each other. And David is about to pour out his wrath on Nabal. But Abigail stepped in the gap and brought peace to the community because of her quick thinking and her good judgment. She also captured David's attention. I love this proverb. It's Proverbs 25, verse 15, where Scripture tells us, through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. You see, sometimes we don't have to bully one another. We don't have hatred and selfishness and pride. All of those things where people want to try to outdo one another and see who's the greatest. You know, some of our greatest accomplishments in our society come about because people extend patience and because people choose to use a gentle, kind word rather than words filled with anger and rage. Or, as the old saying that we have heard growing up, that you'll catch more flies with honey than you will with vinegar. That's a, a pretty true statement. A lot of us have grown up in the South and have learned that. All right. 
Here's where we can draw some really good lessons from that story. Because you see, we sin and we fall short of the glory of God. And we are deserving of God's wrath. And God has been ready to pour out His wrath on us. But at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus stepped in the gap. And His sacrifice can bring peace in our lives and in our relationship with God. Ephesians chapter 2, the first three verses tell us, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So Paul, he paints a perfect picture of our state in our sin, in our transgression, of where we would stand before God. We were by nature deserving of wrath. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 tells us, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ who gave Himself as a ransom for all people. Jesus Christ came and He stood in the gap. Actually, I think a better way to put that is Jesus came and He hung on a cross. He hung on a cross between a sinful world and a holy God. His blood providing the sacrifice that could make peace for us. In fact, that's what Isaiah writes about in Isaiah chapter 53 verses 5 and 6. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him. And by His wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And so we go from this picture of wrath in Ephesians chapter 2, to this picture of Jesus as the mediator in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And then in Isaiah chapter 53, we see the work of Jesus who, who paid the price for our sins to bring peace. And so now the, the question for us, just in the same way that you know, we, saw, we saw how Abigail responded we saw how David responded. We've got to ask ourselves, how are we going to respond to Jesus? You know, there's some people that choose to live a life like Nabal. In fact, there are a lot of people that choose to live a life like Nabal. And it is filled with selfishness and anger and bad tempers and um, non-approachable. Nobody wants to be around them. But man, they just make such a loud noise in our society but that they've made it abundantly clear they don't want anything to do with Jesus. But, but here we are. We have an opportunity because we do sin and fall short, but we have an opportunity to respond to Jesus and His sacrifice, and it can bring peace in our lives, peace between us and God. How will we respond to that? You see, we live in a Nabal world, so we need to also ask our question of, well, what are we going to do? How will we live in that world? You see, a lot of people say, well, that's just the way the game is played. People try to, to out-hurt one another, uh, hurt them before they hurt us, do it to them before they do it to us. And what we're pleading for is to have a heart. And we need more Abigails, people who will be intelligent, who will be striving to live righteous lives of compassion and service. We need people who will just step in that gap in an effort to bring peace. We need more people like those two prisoners of war that came in Chiang Kai, the death house. But they came in with a different mentality. They came in with service and compassion. And they made all the difference in the world. We need people today who will step out in a sinful world 
and be people of righteousness. We need people who will step out in a dark world and be a ray of light. We need people who will step out in a world where hope is all but lost. But we will bring a ray of hope to this world. We'll do that as we share the message of Jesus Christ with others. Oh, I hope that you're listening and to, to our plea to go to Luke chapter 10 verse 2 every day. The harvest is plentiful. Even in a Nabal world, the harvest is plentiful. And what we need is we need to be praying for workers. I don't know. You, you this morning may need to be one of those that responds. To respond to Jesus. To give your life to Him. To confess Him as Lord and Savior. To repent of their sins in your life. And to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, perhaps you've, you've listened to this story this morning and you think, Man, I see just how wise Abigail acted. In the midst of all that sludge around her, she stood up and above the rest. And we want to live like that. Man, I hope we will. That we will be a ray of hope and a beacon of light in this world. Because it so desperately needs it. A world that's dark and a world that is losing hope at such a rapid pace. If there's anything we can do to help you either to come to Christ, to return to Christ. Perhaps you have a prayer request you'd like to share with us. We'd love to help any way we can. Give us a call today at 870-836-5038. That's 870-836-5038.